The kingdom of Jesus is an upside down kingdom where the last is first and the first is last. The humble are exalted and the broken are restored. If ever we need a revival in the world, the time is now. The lasting change we need does not come from the powerful or the influential. True change, real healing, and times of deep renewal are birthed when the people of God humble themselves, pray, and seek His face. It all begins with the church, which means it must begin inside of you and inside of me. This is the moment for the church of Jesus, not to settle for survival, but to call down revival. Good morning, Sugar Creek. It's such a joy to be here with you today. My name is Libin Abraham. I'm thrilled to share with you from God's Word. I want to welcome all three of our campuses, everybody right here at the Sugar Land campus, our Missouri City campus, and our newest campus, the Richmond Rosenberg campus, and of course, all of our incredible brothers in Christ at Darrington. Would you just welcome everybody today? We're so glad to be one church meeting in so many different locations. Now, I've heard the Missouri City staff call their campus the Mo City Campus, and I've heard Richmond Rosenberg call their campus Rich Rose. So Sugarland, I think we need to put our brains together and come up with something pretty cool and pretty trendy. I love how God is just expanding and building more rooms to this local house called Sugar Creek. Hey, I want to show you a picture of the title of Time magazine in April of 1966. Here's the, t- here's the title page of Time magazine. It is entitled, Is God Dead? Is God Dead? Now, I wasn't around in the 60s, but I've heard and read a little bit about it, and it does indeed seem like a very dark decade in the life of our nation. You've got the assassination of JFK. You've got the drug revolution, the sexual revolution. You've got uh, the worst earthquake ever recorded in North American history, which is in Alaska in 1964. And as soon as the civil rights movement was really taking ground, you have the assassination of its figurehead and leader, the Reverend Dr. Martin. Martin Luther King. So if you look around, it could actually seem like God was nowhere to be found. But then things began to change. The tide began to turn. Why? Because the people of God began to call out for revival. They got desperate and they filled up churches and they put up tents and gathered just to pray. Beaches were filled with young people calling out for revival and thousands were saved and baptized. And so fast forward a few years and the title of the exact same magazine, June of 1971, read this, The Jesus Revolution. Just a few years ago, it was, is God dead? But now it's the Jesus revolution. See, what happened is that into the middle of a drug revolution and a sexual revolution, God sent a Jesus revolution. He turned, as we sang on all of our campuses, graves into gardens, bones into armies. He turned seas into highways, and he changed our nation in that moment. In fact, Time Magazine wrote it like this. Here's an excerpt. Jesus is alive and well and living with radical spiritual favor in growing number of young Americans. Their message, the Bible is true. Miracles happen. God really did so love the world that he gave his only begotten son. Their love seems more sincere than a slogan. And what startles the outsider is the extraordinary sense of joy they're able to communicate. If one mark clearly identifies them, it's this, their total belief in an awesome, supernatural Jesus Christ, the living God. Wow. Can you imagine something like that being written in a secular magazine today? Some people have pointed out the similarities, the parallels of the 60s and the times we are living in now. We have political upheaval. We have a nation that's divided. We have a great need for racial reconciliation. We still have a drug problem and a sexual revolution. So perhaps, maybe, We are in need of a Jesus revolution today. See, the greatest need for your life and my life is a revival. The greatest need for our church is a revival. The greatest need for our nation today is none other than a revival. 
Now I know that over the last few months we've been focused on staying safe and sane and keeping our family together. That's good and much needed. But now I believe it's the time to shift our focus from being on the defense to now being on the offense. From focusing on survival to now focusing on revival. See the church of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God has often made its greatest advancements in times of upheaval, chaos, and uncertainty. The church has grown the most. We have experienced the kingdom of God ushered in in incredible ways, especially in times of chaos, upheaval, and uncertainty. If you need proof, you just look to the first three centuries of the Christian church. Everybody was against the church. Everyone wanted to see this early movement of this minority group shut down, their voices silenced, the political leaders, the religious leaders, the culture, the skeptics. They wanted so badly to discredit the resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, in the first few centuries, there were pandemics. There were national crises. But let me tell you, the church of Jesus did not just maintain, and it certainly wasn't silence. They literally thrived and turned their world upside down. So Sugar Creek and all of our campus, I've got news for you. The kingdom of God cannot be hindered. The church of Jesus will not be stopped. In fact, it is now time for the church of Jesus to rise up because light is most needed in the dark and hope is most longed for in despair. Yes, the world is dark, but that's when we need light. Yes, there are so many in despair. This is a moment we need hope in the world. We've got something to say. People are thinking about death and eternity far more than ever before because of the imminent dangers that faced them. So I've got to tell you today, we've got a message to share. We've got hope to give. We've got an answer to point to, and his name is Jesus. Amen? His name is Jesus. I wonder if you would help me today on all three campuses in this call and response. We have an answer. His name is? Jesus. We've got one who can save us. His name is? We've got the solution to the world's problem today. His name is? Jesus. Amen. Come on, if you believe that, give Jesus an ovation of praise today. We've got something to give. We can't be silenced. And today, we are beginning this new series over the next three weeks where we're joining our hearts together collectively around this one prayer found in Psalm 85, verse 6. This is a prayer for revival. So we're going to say this together. I want you to pray this around your dinner table. Let your kids memorize this short verse. It's our plea of desperation. Here is what Psalm 85, verse 6 says. Will you not revive us again? so that your people may rejoice in you. Let's say that together out of a desperate plea to God. This is our corporate collective prayer. God, let's say this together. Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Here's a prayer for revival over the next three weeks. What is a revival? A lot of times we use the words revival and awakening interchangeably, and certainly there are so many similarities, but there is a distinction. An awakening happens when someone experiences God for the first time. And maybe you're here today on any of our campuses or watching from home, and you're far from God. Today I'm praying for an awakening where your heart comes alive to the goodness of Jesus, to the message of salvation that only Christ can, ho can offer you. We need an awakening in the world, but a revival is different. See, God sends an awakening into the world, but he sends a revival into the church. The world needs an awakening, but believers of Jesus, the church of Christ, needs a revival. So what's a revival? A revival is a move of God where he recalibrates the heart of a Christian. He makes you centered on him again, focused on him again. A revival is a return to God, a coming back, a running after God again. In a revival, we are more aware of the presence of God and particularly his holiness because when you get a glimpse of his glory it always results in repentance and worship and mutual love and evangelism this is the revival we need this is the awakening we need in the world but for the for the for the gospel to awaken the world it has to first awaken the church which means it must begin inside of me and inside of you. 
It means the fire has to be rekindled in our heart and my heart and in your heart that it has to begin with the church of Jesus because no revival has ever taken place without a group of Christ followers desperate for it and they got passionate. They got desperate for God to do something once again. So it begins with saying, God, revive me. The prayer of revive us begins with God. Will you revive me? A personal revival. I want to ask you to imagine something for me. Imagine you had the most perfect life you could ever imagine. If you're a student, you're at the top of your class. If you're married, you have just married the, the, the spouse of your fairy tales. You got the job of your dreams. You're living in a house that could literally be the cover of a magazine. You got the most beautiful kids who never do anything wrong. They always obey. They always listen. You got the most perfect grandchildren. You got tons of money, influence, the best of friends. Everything seems right except for one little thing. You feel distant with Jesus. You've got everything going on right, but you're missing a closeness to Jesus. You're not walking with him and you're not experiencing the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So here's my question to you. If you had everything going so well, but a closeness to Jesus, would that bother you? Or would you settle for everything but a real closeness to Jesus? Would that be enough? Or would you be desperate for closeness to Jesus? See, Psalm 85 is actually pretty interesting because it's written by the sons of Korah as they're leading the Israelites in this prayer, the song of revival. And interestingly enough, this is a really good time for Israel. They're back from exile. They're back on their native soil. They're reunited with their families and God has forgiven their sins. So from the outside looking in, everything seems to be really, really good. The psalmist begins like this in verse 1. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. What could be missing? They're free. They're forgiven. They're home. They've got material blessings, national blessings, personal blessing. What's possibly missing? Well, there was only one thing missing. They were lacking the luster of their faith. They were lacking zeal with God. They're missing this closeness with God Almighty. So they pray, God, we've got the blessings, but we'd rather be rejoicing in you. So I, got you to, I, got, I want you to know that we should not always equate God's blessings with his nearness. We shouldn't always equate God's blessings with his nearness. Sometimes life could be great. You're not in turmoil. You're living an amazing, incredible life. But that doesn't mean that God is near. Sometimes God blesses you because he's kind to you. He is being gracious and merciful to you. So don't ever look at the goodness of your life and thinking, well, I'm close to God. God's near to me. No, the Israelites had everything going right, but they missed a closeness with God Almighty. I imagine that if you own a car, that from time to time, maybe every three months or six months or 10,000 miles, you take your car in for an oil change or some maintenance need. Every time I take my vehicle, they do a multi-point inspection, which is a diagnostic test to make sure that I've got everything working right in my car. And sometimes they'll say, sir, Mr. Abraham, there's something wrong in your vehicle. we got to fix it. And I hate paying for it. And usually I'll dig up some cheaper price to do it. But I know that in the best interest of my vehicle, i got to get this fixed because a diagnostic test has been ran. And every so often as Christ's followers, we need to run a diagnostic test inside of us. How are we doing spiritually? What areas do we need revival, renewal in? And I imagine you don't just take your car in for an oil change once in the lifetime of that vehicle. No, you don't say, well, I've done it six years ago. I'm good to go. No, the more you drive it, the more dust, debris, and dirt can contaminate the oil in your car and ruin your engine. So every periodically, every often, you get it cleaned. The preacher Billy Sunday was asked by a lady, sir, why do you keep preaching revivals when it doesn't last? And he replied to her, man, why do you keep taking baths when it doesn't last? 
because we are in constant need of revival. Today I'm in need of revival. Today you're in need to be revived because every single day life is throwing at us every single thing it possibly can in order to pollute our soul. And if we're not constantly cleaning our hearts and reviving our spirit, the health of our soul could actually be in great jeopardy. We are in need of a revival, especially over the last six or so months as we've been sequestered in our home away from the physical, visible gathering of believers. It's possible that your heart has grown cold, that you're not on fire for Jesus as you was before, that there's something missing. And we need to ask ourselves these five diagnostic questions. So here they are, diagnostic questions for personal revival. Number one, have I become overly busy? that I have stopped prioritizing my time with God? Have I gotten too busy, too distracted, too busy, too occupied, that I've stopped prioritizing my time with God? Ancient Rome had this popular slogan, which was really their political strategy. It was simply this bread and circuses, bread and circuses. They knew that as long as they could provide people enough bread and circuses, meaning food and entertainment, that people would be so busy, they would be so entertained, they'd be so full that they wouldn't really pay attention to the real issues and the real injustices of Rome. They knew that as long as they kept people busy and and entertained and full, they wouldn't ask or demand for better service or better policy. They would be too preoccupied to pay attention to the real condition of their state, bread and circuses. I think the enemy has done the same for Christians today. He's kept us busy. He's kept us entertained. He's kept us full of so many things because he knows that if we can just be entertained and be preoccupied with lesser things, with things that don't really matter, if we can just scroll all day long on social media, we won't really have time to pay real close attention to the condition of our heart, to the condition of our spirit, bread and circuses. So let me ask you, Sugar Creek, how are you doing on the inside? How are you doing spiritually? What's the state of your heart with the Lord? What's the temperature of your prayer life? We know that any healthy relationship is contingent on communication, both in its depth and frequency. How long has it been since you've had some uninterrupted moments with Jesus? That you've listened to the promptings of the Spirit, that you've really made it a regular habit? a delight, a discipline with the Lord that you've prioritized time with God greater than anything else. Listen to Psalm 63 verse one and the language that David uses here. You God are my God, earnestly I seek you. Not out of convenience, not when I've got some room for it. No, earnestly without any reservations, God, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Like newborn babies, and I've got a one-year-old at home. Man, nothing gets in the way of his bottle. If he's hungry, get to him the bottle. Like newborn babies crave, have this intense desire for pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Have a kind of thirst that nothing else will can quench but God. Have this all-absorbing desire that's taken over you that's gripped your heart, craving for God, craving for his presence, longing just a few more moments with your creator. How long has it been since you've lost track of time with God? Since you've been in his word and you're longing to hear, not from a preacher, not from a YouTuber or a podcaster, but from God himself opening up his word and let him reviving the deepest part of your life. Psalm 19 verse 7 says it like this, the law of the Lord, the word of God is perfect, reviving, refreshing the soul. There have been times that Satan and I have been tired and weary, and I thought more coffee would help, but it didn't. So we had to open the scriptures and say, God, revive me, refresh my soul, get me back on track, speak to me, I need to hear your voice again. We all believe that God speaks, and that he doesn't stop speaking. But if I already ask you, what's the last thing he told you? You might have a hard time recalling because it's been so long. 
Revival means we prioritize time with the Lord. We get desperate on our knees, praying to him, speaking to him, hearing his word deep in our heart. Question number two, have I been excusing away sins in my life? Have I been excusing away sins in my life? When we're distant from God, we begin to justify our actions, excuse away our sins, our thoughts, our lifestyles. And we say things like, well, it doesn't really hurt anybody else. It's just my little deal. It's my secret. It's my choice. It doesn't hurt anyone else. Surely this is okay. And we'll begin to bend God's word to fit our passions and our desires. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says it like this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Isaiah is saying, God wants to be close to you. He wants to reach out and get a hold of your life. He wants to hear your prayer, but your sins, which are unconfessed before God, your sins, which are sealed and locked and tucked away, have kept God at bay from you. Isaiah experiences first 10. You go back to Isaiah 6, and there in Isaiah 6, in the year King Isaiah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw God Almighty seated on a throne high and lifted up. He saw the seraphim worshiping God, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And in the worship of God's holiness, the temple was filled with smoke, and the doorways of heaven shook. And Isaiah is here watching the scene, this, experiencing the presence, the holiness, the majesty of God. What do you do in a moment like that? Do you excuse away your sins? Do you say, well, I think my good works are better than my bad works and I've got 51% to my credit of good works? Do you compare your sins to other people? Do you hide behind your credentials or achievements or even your Christian experience? No, not at all. Isaiah could have done any of that. But his only response is, woe is me. Woe is me, I'm a ruined man. I'm sinful God. I've got unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. See, we would have excused that. Away. Isaiah, it's just your language. It's just your personality. It's just words. It's okay. God will forgive you. He knows your heart. You're a prophet. You're a servant. It's okay. No, in view of God's holiness, Isaiah would not excuse away the sins we would have. He didn't have to reach the top shelf and find some big sin that would have been convicted. No, he began with his mere words. God, my thoughts, my words, my motives, my passions make me unclean. And Isaiah gave God a broken, contrite heart of confession and pleading to God in view of his presence. And in that moment, when Isaiah offered himself as he really was, not his pretend self, not his filtered version, but his honest plea, the coal from the altar of God came and cleansed Isaiah, and he was never the same. In fact, God used the very thing he confessed, redefined him for God's glory and purpose as he became a prophet, a spokesperson for the Lord Almighty. Proverbs says it like this in chapter 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you, my friend, if you're living in sin, if today you will look to God with a heart of brokenness, God looks at you with a heart of mercy. He will wrap his big, strong, powerful arms around you. He will embrace you. He will welcome you back. He will show you mercy. He will hear your presence so that you can rejoice in God again. If you're lacking joy, come to him with a confession. Come to him with a desperate plea. He never refuses the desperate, honest plea of our confession. Prioritize our time with him. Do not excuse away the sins in our life. And number three, question number three, am I harboring hatred or unforgiveness towards someone? Am I harboring hatred or unforgiveness towards someone? We live in such polarizing times where we have ample opportunity to build up and harbor hatred for unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment towards people. And if we're not so careful, we'll be so quick to lash out at somebody who disagrees with us. We'll judge an entire person based on one post and we'll tear somebody down because they don't see the way we do. 
And all the while, what it's doing is making your own heart heavy with bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, resentment. It's slowing you down. It's weighing you down and building this distance between you and the Lord when we harbor those things deep in our heart. Sugar Creek, what if we here at Sugar Creek were a people on all of our campus, that we were a people who are hard to offend but quick to forgive? We were hard to offend but quick to forgive. We don't get offended by the smallest things, but we are quick to forgive others. We show each other mercy. We listen to the other person with grace. And even if we don't agree on some things, we step into their shoes and empathize with them and hear their point of reference and we build a relationship and we refuse by all means to harbor unforgiveness, bitterness, or resentment in our heart. How light will we feel? How freed will we be to be hard to offend and quick to forgive. Jesus gave us his stern warning after he taught us the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. And this topic of forgiveness was the only point he felt like he needed to expand on because he knew that our human nature would struggle with that. Matthew 6 verse 14, Jesus said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you or your sins. Jesus is saying, the level of mercy you receive from the Father is dependent on the level of mercy you give to others. If you can't forgive people their mere human sins, how can you expect God to forgive you of your sins? If you've never tasted that forgiveness from the Lord, it's gonna be hard to forgive others. But once your sins have been forgiven and you realize that your great rebellion against God has been wiped clean and he's had mercy on you, he was patient with you, he was gracious with you, you are compelled, you are urged to be hard to offend and quick to forgive. James, the half-brother of Jesus, said it like this in James 2 verse 12, speak and act as those who are gonna be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Catch this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Is mercy triumphing in your life or is bitterness triumphing in your life? Is your opinion triumphing in your life or is mercy triumphing in your life? Let me tell you when a revival takes place. When it takes place, we seek out to give mercy even if we don't feel like others have given to us. We initiate, we take the first step of reconciliation and we pursue forgiveness and forgive others even if they haven't yet asked for it. Because we are modeling what Jesus has done for us. Hard to offend, but quick to forgive. Prioritize your time with the Lord. It's, do not excuse away sins. Be quick to forgive and let things go. Diagnostic question number four. Have I become indifferent about people who are without a relationship with Jesus? Have I become indifferent about those who are without Christ? What do you feel when someone who's without Christ comes to you? Steps into your home, your office, your class. Do you feel anything at all? Indifferent apathy? about a family member, a neighbor, a coworker, who is headed to an eternity apart from Christ, do you feel a burden, a compassion, a love for them? One of the most defining moments in my life was in my first couple of years of, my second year of college, I, I was working uh, at a little Verizon store in the mall. That was my job. And one of the benefits of working at a Verizon store in the mall in a small town like Chattanooga, Tennessee, was you got to see people all the time that you knew. On one particular day, I got to run into my friend from high school, and he was like the most healthy, uh, strong guy I've ever met. He was literally a bodybuilder from Ukraine. So it was a slow day, so we ended up talking for about 45 minutes. Don't tell my previous boss this, but we talked for a little while at my job. And we talked about everything, life, sports, family, future plans, career, college, everything but his faith. And I knew deep in my heart that he was far from God. So we talked for a while and then we went our separate ways and he told me as he left, hey, I gotta go to Knoxville tomorrow for a bike rally. I'm racing tomorrow in Knoxville, racing my bike. And so we bid our farewell and we went our separate ways. About three weeks goes by and at the store again, I see his sister shopping one day and I say, hey, I got to run into your brother a few weeks ago. How are you guys doing? How's he doing? And she said, oh, you didn't hear. 
He was in Knoxville a few weeks ago for a bike rally and had a terrible accident and died. I can't describe to you what I felt in that moment, a ton of bricks hitting my soul, thinking, did I miss a moment? I know that God is sovereign and all, I know that, but did I miss my moment to express the gospel to him, give him the only thing that could have saved him the day before he died? Did I miss my moment, my opportunity, the Lord put me in? Because I cared about everything else but his eternity. Mike Penberthy was a former basketball player for the Los Angeles Lakers. He's on staff now as an associate coach. And he talked about how he was a Christian during the height of his envious success, but he was so silent about his faith because he wanted to fit in. He didn't want to cause issues. He wanted people to like him. So he became silent about his faith in Jesus. And after retirement, he said, I would have these nightmares and in my nightmares were former teammates that I played with, that I hung out with, that I did life with. But now my teammates are being thrown into hell. They're being thrust into this lake of fire. And on their way into hell, they're looking at me in the eye and saying, you knew about this? And you didn't tell me anything? You wanted me to like you? You wanted to fit in so you kept this real place a secret? How could you not tell me this is where? I was going. In that moment, nothing matters than that reality. Charles Spurgeon said it so well when he said, if sinners perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Don't let one go unwarned or unprayed for. Paul felt this anguish in Romans 9, verse 2. I have got great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. He got on to say, they're without Christ and whatever it takes, I'm willing to do. I've got this anguish I can't get it away from. You can't numb it with entertainment. This concern, this burden, this anguish, you can't just shake off of you because people are headed to an eternity away from God. I want you to feel this the next moment you see somebody without Christ and let love compel you, let it urge you to share the gospel, invite them to Jesus, invite them to our church and say, come be a part of something. You can have a new life in Christ Jesus. The last question that sums it all up for us is this. Have I been closer to God at some time in the past than I am now? Have you been closer to God at some point in the past than you are in this very moment? Remember that moment, what was it like? What did you do differently? What was life, the rhythm of your life like? Have you been closer to the Lord than you are now? Revival means this is the closest we've ever been. Tomorrow is the closest I've ever been. And we don't settle for some great experience in the past, some great relationship with Jesus, knowing that we're saved and on our way to heaven. No, we long for a daily walk. We long for the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We long to be close to him now more than ever before. The truth is this, we cannot organize a revival, but we can agonize for one. We can produce it, that's God's job. We can produce it, but we can prepare for it. We can long for it. We can get on our knees and knock on the doors of heaven saying, God, in my life, in my day, will you send a revival to my city, to my nation, to my church? So here's what we're doing. We're calling our entire church on all three campuses and everyone watching online or at home. We're calling you to three weeks of prayer, deep spiritual prayer for renewal and revival. So if you go to sugarcreek.net slash revive us, it's on your notes, it's on our website. Go to that link, sugarcreek.net slash revive us. You'll see what the next three weeks of prayer will look like. And here's the most important thing. Sign up for a 30 minute prayer slot over the next three weeks. Just one 30 minute slot. My, my vision, my dream is that for the next 21 days that begins tomorrow, October 5th and ending on October 25th, we would have three weeks of continual chain prayer in our church. There wouldn't be an hour, there wouldn't be a minute that goes without somebody in our church praying for revival. So commit to a 30 minute prayer and be faithful to it. And we got prayer guides on there for you. And on Tuesday nights on all of our campuses, there will be a 
prayer meeting for revival at the chapel here, at the worship center in Missouri City and Richmond Rosenberg at 7 p.m. If you can gather in person to pray, come. If you can't, you can join us online on a Zoom prayer meeting as well. Let's be serious about this because I don't want to go through another year where we're not experiencing the closeness, the sweetness of our Father. But if we can agonize it for it as a body, as a church, what could God do in the next year? Would you stand with me today on all of our campuses? I know we're not usually standing as we close, but could you stand with me? This is your sign that says, God, I want a revival. I want a time of renewal. I want mercy to flood our city, our nation. And it begins with you inside your own heart, your own soul. So if you haven't been able to answer one of these questions honestly today, as we've just looked at a few, and there are more questions you can ask yourself. Are you in need of revival? I believe we all are in some sense. Let's do this together. Maybe you're here today and you're far from God. I'm praying that you are awakened to the good news of Jesus. You can speak to one of our ministers on our physical campuses or go to our online Next Step Center. May today be the day of salvation that you turn your heart by faith to Christ to join our church to be a part of what God's doing. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we come to you. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. We offer our desperate plea, our petition, our desire for revival. Only you can do it. God, but we want to do a part and preparing and praying and agonizing and longing for it. So lead us closer to you now than ever before. God, give us a desperation that says, even if we have all of the blessings of life without Christ and without a closeness, without an intimacy with Jesus, it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters for all eternity is our walk with Jesus. Our boldness, our conviction to share Christ, to repent of our sins, to prioritize our time with you, to not harbor unforgiveness or be carried by the weight of this world. God, Father, set us free, O God of revival. Awaken our hearts, revive our soul today, cleanse us from the inside out. And if anyone here under the sound of my voice at any campus is far from you, today may they run home to their Father that's waiting and longing for them. In Jesus' Mighty name we pray, amen and amen.